All right. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's great to to get to know everybody, and I I just wanted to say that not everybody at UBC is called is named Martin. We do have some other names as well, but uh, it's my joke for this morning. Um, all right. So I think we've already been through in terms of the the license. I'll be uh, teaching the next couple of modules in partnership with Edmund. And really the purpose of this first module is to kind of frame the discussion that we're going to be having around chip sequence, chip sequencing analysis. And we've also this year spiked in a little bit of a tax seek because in previous years, um, many students have been interested in learning a little bit about a, about a tax seek. And as you'll see, the attack seek workflow is uh, uh, almost nearly identical to the chip seek, with the exception of some some details that we'll we'll get into around how you process the data. So with that, I'll get started. So uh, you know, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground. I mean, covering a lot of conceptual ground work uh, in the in the next few lectures, and I'm also going to be talking about some pretty deep technical um, jargon. Uh, in my experience, uh, you know, it's it's best to ask questions as we go along. I won't be able to monitor the Slack channel. I will be able to see uh, hands, I think. And of course, there are many other fabulous folks on the line who can point out if there are any questions. So really encourage you to engage in the material as it's as it's coming uh, and um, and raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, be present uh, in, in the virtual classroom uh, and have fun. <laughs> Uh, and there are no, uh, I know this is cliche, but there are no dumb questions. Uh, if you have a question, I'm sure someone else in this room has the same question. So feel free to shout it out. And that, that allows us to sort of cover material that we that we don't have time to cover or that I, have, I don't have in the slides. Um, and also, you know, the, the slides here are really meant as a, as a resource for you to take notes from. Um, so do uh, do take notes and the slides will be available or are available. I did upload them on the Google Doc. I don't know. I guess that gets pushed out or maybe it's already available. Um, so, so you should have a, co a copy of the slides as well. All right. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, um, we're going to be talking about chip sequencing um, and uh, and a little bit of a taxi, as I said. And you know, really what, what has enabled us to be able to look at measurements of functional regulatory regions in the genome has really been the development of next generation sequencing platforms, and in particular, second generation sequencing platforms. So these are platforms that um, are able to sequence small fragments of DNA, uh, highly multiplexed. Um, and it was really the development of these technologies in, in 2005, 2006, that really launched the field of epigenomics. And for myself, that's really how I got interested in it. Um, I was working on um, one of the first uh, Selexa instruments at the time uh, called Illumina, working with someone by the name of Tony Kuzaridis, who was at Cambridge. Um, and he had done some chip and I had the sequencer and we did some of the first chip seq libraries uh, that were done um, uh, using uh, histone mods at the time. Uh, and, and really I got hooked as soon as I started seeing the data aligned on the genome browser. So the two technologies that we're going to be talking about here uh, today are uh, number two, chromatin immunoprecipitation, and then a flavor of open chromatin analysis. Um, both use some methodology or all use some methodology to shear up the genome, and we need to shear up the genome as we'll talk about um, because we need to generate short fragments that'll that allow us to to sequence on a on a, a second generation sequencing platform and it just so happens that those fragments are about the same size as uh, the wrap of DNA around a nucleosome and so it actually makes a, a pretty nice marriage between a, a, a molecular application and, and a technical application. So the learning objectives of this first uh, part of this uh, of this module are really to, to understand the approaches and utility of epigenetic measurements in genomic-based research, and I'll really high level briefly touch on on why we're interested in in studying this area at all, um, and then we'll talk about um, the principles and challenges of chip seek and and attack seek analysis. Um, and then by the end of this lecture, you should be familiar uh, at the high level with the chip seek and, and, and attack seek um, workflow uh, and selected quality measurements um, that we use. And then really in the next module, uh, we'll get into some more of the technical details uh, of, uh, of, of the workflow itself. So hang on, I've got to close this screen. There we go. All right. No, I can't see anything. 
All right. So, you know, why are we interested in epigenetics at all? Well, you know, I think uh, most of us on this call probably have some understanding, I'm assuming, of, of what epigenetics is. But, you know, you know, for me, you know, there are many um, common diseases, human traits, and, uh, and indeed memory itself um, that in part may be encoded uh, in the epigenetic state. And these are examples I, I, I use in class, but, you know, I think, I think we really, you know, go across the breadth of those, uh, those types of uh, concepts. So, so first really thinking about in, in utero exposure, of course, um, in uh, times of, uh, in, in times of famine, um, there have been a number of studies that have, uh, that have revealed what appears to be evidence of some type of transgenerational inheritance, um, one being the Dutch hunger winter that occurred in the Second World War, um, where babies uh, or women that were pregnant during that time were uh, subjected to severe caloric restriction, something on the order of about 300 calories a day. And the babies that were born from women that were pregnant during that period of time did, of course, have low birth weight. Um, but of course, once they were born, um, the famine was over and, and the children grew up in, in a normal, uh, normal environment. Um, however, uh, as those children aged, uh, they showed higher prevalence of many common diseases, such as uh, cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, psychiatric disorders, and, and, and so on. And, and perhaps even more surprising is that the children or the grandchildren of the women um, who were pregnant during that period of time are also showing this high prevalence, suggesting perhaps that there is some sort of epigenetic mechanism or some sort of transgenerational inheritance that's occurred um, from the babies that were born uh, during that period of time. And of course, I think intuitively, maybe this would make sense if we think about um, epigenetic mechanisms as a way of sensing the environment and preparing the organism for the environment in which it will be, uh, in which it will be born and raised. And, and perhaps, you know, preparing for famine and, and programming the, the metabolic state uh, to, to, you know, to be, to be ready for a famine and then being born into, an, uh, into a time when it's not a famine and having a, basically a metabolic program that's, that's not uh, aligned with, with the, the actual environment. Common traits and diseases. So the middle panel here, I guess I could put on a little laser pointer here. Um, in the middle panel here, of course, we have um, examples of uh, traits that, uh, uh, that align or that are very highly correlated with genetics. And so we're looking at identical twins. Those are twins that have an identical genome um, and fraternal twins, uh, same environment, but not identical genome. And we can see that for some traits, uh, it's highly correlated with, with genotype. In fact, almost all of your height, for example, can be described by by your genotype alone. However, for most common diseases, including psychiatric diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, and many cancers, um, the link to genetics is actually very low, um, suggesting that there are some there's some other feature, and of course that's um, potentially uh, ep epigenetic uh, mechanisms um, uh, that occur. And so there are many examples of of identical twins, for example, where one of the twins will have uh, leukemia uh, and the other will not. Um, and again, leukemia is a type of disease. It's a it's a uh, a type of cancer of the blood. Um, and and leukemia is def is often uh, and if not always uh, involving uh, uh, some level of epigenetic dif dysfunction uh, in DNA methylation. In fact, memory I think is another uh, very interesting and emerging area. In this particular case, I'm showing you here a fly model. Um, where uh, short-term memory or long-term memory can be measured, it, it turns out that flies remember if they have uh, if they have made it or not. Um, and if you knock out an enzyme that's involved in in mediating epigenetic mechanisms, in this particular case, uh, a methylation of, of H3K9 uh, trimethylation or dimethylation, um, this can in inhibit both short-term memory, that's the red bar here, and long-term memory, suggesting that. Perhaps epigenetic mechanisms are playing a role in uh, in the development of memory. So, uh, you know, what do we know about epigenetics? Well, we know that you know you have about three hundred cell types in your body, and as far as we know, each of those cell types is packaged. Uh, each of those cell types um, uh, has unique packaging, and this packaging provides a regulatory um, roadmap uh, for cell type specification. 
Um, and we, uh, myself, and, and many of the, the members of, of, of the, the, the teaching team here have been involved in generating reference maps as part of the International Human Epigenome Consortium. So I've been involved in this work since, um, uh, well, for over, uh, over a decade now. Um, initially with the Roadmap Consortium, so many of you might be aware of, of this paper. So this is our first uh, publication of reference epigenome maps, where we took a set of in, uh, ChIP-seq uh, data sets and then used a hidden Markov model to then predict uh, chromatin states across the genome. Uh, this is work of Jason Ernst and Manolis Kellis and many others. Um, and then we painted the genome uh, with these uh, with these uh, uh, chromatin states as a way of of uh, layering the regulatory uh, information over the genome. So each row here represents an individual cell type, and we've labeled the cell types here uh, on the on the left hand column. And so this was an initial pass at about 111 um, uh, reference or 111 human cell types, and and subsequently we've, we've continued to expand that as I'll talk about in a minute. So what are these histone modifications? Um, uh, hopefully every most people here are aware of them, but uh, just to remind us that they come in a, in a really two main flavors, um, uh, activating um, modifications. So this includes, for example, H3K4 trimethylation, H3K4 monomethylation that it marks active and promoters and enhancers respectively. Um, and H3K27 acetylation, which marks uh, active enhancers. And they also come in repressive states. So this includes, uh, for example, polycomb H3K27 trimethylation. And in fact, uh, you know, H3K27 trimethylation um, is one of the modifications that's most often disrupted in, in many common diseases, in, including many cancers. Um, the nomenclature that we use in, in the ChIP-seq uh, field or in the epigenetic field, just to remind everybody, there's a, quite a bit of information encoded in this name. Uh, the first two characters refer to the histone, in this case, histone H3, um, the, the amino acid that's modified. So this in this case, lysine 4, so the fourth amino acid from the N-terminal tail of, of, the, uh, of the histone H3, and then the modification it, itself. So in this particular case, trimethylation. So H3K4 trimethylation, um, H3K4 monomethylation, and so on. And as you can see, the, the same lysine, so K27, can be acetylated, and that has a particular meaning, for example, is associated with active enhancers. Um, but the same uh, lysine can be um, methylated, in this case, trimethylated, um, and that can uh, uh, be associated with a repressive chromatin state. So that this set of histone modifications, you may ask why these were why these were selected. So these were initially selected as part of the roadmap program, and they were selected as a set of histone modifications that best describe the epigenomic state. There are many, many more. In fact, there is about a hundred different histone um, methylation uh, or histone modification. Um, events that, that have been measured using orthologous technologies such as mass spec. Um, and as part of the roadmap program, um, uh, there were a number of uh, groups that had done a full panel of histone mods, about 30 or 40 of them. And then we reduced those down to a set that were the most informative. And so these are probably the marks that many of you are aware of. There are, of course, many others, and, and, and some of those other marks have subsequently turned out to be quite informative. But that was why the, this set of five uh, or six uh, core histone marks were, were, were selected. And as I just mentioned, you know, these have now been used in, as a larger cohort. And this is, this is ongoing work um, to generate the, the next, um, uh, what, what we're calling the Epi Atlas, which is a follow-on from, from the Roadmap Initiative and the Blueprint Initiative. Um, and this is really uh, meant to provide a reference framework for comparative analysis. And you know, stay tuned. Uh, the, these data should be made available um, uh, uh, to the uh, publicly um, in the spring of, of 2024. So Q, Q1 of 2024. Um, and this just sort of gives you an idea of, of the framework, the bioinformatics framework that was built um, to, to provide a unified analysis of this data. So we're collecting data from a large number of consortia around the world um, and then running it through a standardized um, uh, data staging and data processing workflow uh, to then generate um, a set of tracks 
uh, and a, a set of chromatin states um, that are available that are then made available to the research community. Now, why do we have to go through all this trouble, you may ask? Well, because we're dealing with human subject data, human subject data is protected. And so it's not the sequence level data um, is not made available uh, to the uh, in, in the public in the public repositories. And so uh, we have to come up with a mechanism that we can process this data in, in such a way that the, the, the genotypes remain protected. And yet we can then share the output of that. And the way we have done this is a, essentially to generate a series of, of containers so these are packages, uh, or essentially packaged workflows that would allow you then to reprocess your data uh, using the same analytical workflows and then compare it to, uh, to the, the compendium of data using that has been generated using the identical workflows. So in fact, the data that we'll be uh, discussing and, and working with in, in the next three modules um, uh, has come from the IHEC consortium um, and uh, this uh, includes two uh, types of data sets. Um, one is MCF10A. So this is a cell line. This is a mammary epithelial cell line. Um, and you can see the details here. It was isolated back in 1984. Um, uh, and this MCF10A is, is open access. So it's open. It's an open genome. And so this data is, is the data that you guys will be analyzing because we can share with you the FASTQ files or the raw sequence files from which obviously the genotypes can be called. We will be comparing this, or Edmund will be leading a module comparing this um, to data sets that have been generated through pr from protected genomes. Um, and this is actually data that was generated um, as part of the IHEC consortium and is generated from uh, reduction mammoplasty material where we've sorted for, uh, for uh, mammary epithelial cell types. And, and I think we'll be taking one or two of these cell types and then comparing it to the MCF10A. And the protected genome data sets will be shared with you in the format of, of what we call a bed file. So this is a, uh, a reduced, uh, or this is a representation or a transformation of the data sets uh, that allows for comparative analysis. And if you're interested in learning more about this work um, and, and, uh, and the Canadian consortium that's driving it, um, please go to, uh, to this website here. Okay, so there are many, many different approaches to ChIP-seq. Um, so uh, there are chip, there are chip seek mechanism, there are chip seek protocols that use cross-linking. There are chip seek protocols that, um, well, cross-linking followed by uh, sonication or some methodology for sharing. There's native uh, chip seek that uses an MNAs um, uh, activity. There, are, there are there is chip seek that uses transposons. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. Um, you know, uh, indexing prior to IP, indexing after IP, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of these um, these workflows uh, or the data sets that emerge from these workflows or the FASTQ files, as we'll talk about, can be processed using the workflows that we'll talk about over the next few days. But we're going to be talking about, or I will be talking about in depth, a little bit of more about traditional chip seek. So I'm not going to be talking about indexed um, strategies, uh, mint chip, et cetera. Um, but just remember that those workflows or, or those data sets uh, can also be processed using the same uh, workflows. So what is ChIP-seq? Well, ChIP-seq uh, is a sequencing-based approach uh, and used to quantitatively measure histone modification patterns in the genome. And this panel on the right-hand side really shows a, a typical representation of how we interact with this data, at least um, manually or from a visualization perspective. And you'll be getting, you'll, you'll be introduced uh, to, to how we generate these tracks over the next few modules. But just to remind us, this is a genome browser. So this is the UCSC genome browser developed by Jim Kent for the Human Genome Project, where we can then lay features or what we call tracks. So each one of these rows represents a different track. Each track is a chip seek experiment from an individual sample. Um, and the height of the histogram here uh, indicates signal density. And that signal density is a transformation of the uh, alignments um, that are generated uh, from, the, from the IP material. So what, what can you see? When, and then of course we've cut, well, we've colored these. Uh, different colors depending upon which particular histone uh, we are targeted in the chip seek. So for example, H3K4 trimethylation is at the top here, 
and we can see these nice peaks marking the the start sites of transcriptional uh, or the uh, transcriptional start sites k4 monomethylation k27 acetylation in blue here and then we can start to see some of these larger what well, you know sort of more broadly dispersed marks like k27 trimethylation in brown here um and uh, and then dna methylation shown at the bottom which which uh, guillaume and others will get into uh, i think in, uh, tomorrow so, you know, what can you see from this data? Well, you can see the patterns of the chipsy. You can see the relationships between the marks. You can see that some marks are correlated. Some marks are anti-correlated. You can see if we look at DNA methylation, which is shown here, um, and the height of the histogram here indicates um, uh, the uh, level of CPG methylation, you can start to see relationships indeed between histone modifications, in this case, K27 trimethylation and DNA methylation. So I hope you can appreciate that there's a pattern here that seems to mirror the occupancy of K27 trimethylation, uh, you know, showing uh, the well-known relationship between these two marks. Okay, so what does the, the CHIP-seq analysis workflow look like? This is why we're here today. Um, so it, it really at a very high level looks like this. We start with uh, our IP, um, so this is our chromatin amino precipitation. Um, and input FASTQ, and I'll, we'll be talking about what a FASTQ file is in, in, in a few, few slides. Uh, the FASTQ file is the input, and so this will be the file that you get from your sequence provider when you do your ChIP-seq experiment. Um, and uh, that FASTQ file will be uh, labeled by whatever the, the, you know, your target chip was, uh, and of course your input. We use a short read aligner, and we'll be talking about what, what these are in, in, uh, in a few slides. Um, uh, and, and in, for this module, we'll be using something called BWA, um, which is one flavor of a short read aligner. Uh, we'll use that aligner to align our reads to the genome, um, and that will generate uh, a SAM file, which will convert into a binary format called the BAM file. We'll use some tools to then sort um, and dupe mark those files, and then pass those into our uh, peak caller called MAX2. And the output of MAX2 will be a bed graph file. Uh, and bed files, and those are the file types that we're showing represented here. So that's really the workflow uh, for ChIP-seq. And as I mentioned, we we're just going to really briefly touch on a few aspects of ATAC-seq. So what is ATAC-seq? ATAC-seq is a way of generating uh, open chromatin data, so data that represents uh, where in the uh, regions of the genome that are nucleosome-free, and we know these nucleosome-free regions uh, tend to, to, to be enriched in regulatory elements, so these are regions of the genome that are bound by transcription factors or that occur at open promoters where nucleosomes are phased. There are many different ways of assessing open chromatin. The first methodologies uh, were DNAs one sequence, uh, DNAs one sequencing, uh, uh, you know, really, uh, I guess, productionized by John Stamilopoulos' group uh, uh, in, uh, near near us down in Seattle. There's also MNA seq where we just use a, a, a mononuclease to digest the genome. But then we're ended, we end up with these set of fragments, which we can then build libraries. ATAC-seq is, is different than T DNAs1 and MNAs-seq uh, in the sense that it uses a transposon to insert a DNA a tag onto the genome that allows us to lift that out and, and generate the, special, the specialized molecular libraries that we need uh, for sequencing. So analysis is very similar. In fact, you can take an ATAC-seq library, a FASTQ, and run it through essentially the identical pipeline that you run ChIP-seq through, the major difference being that you don't have an input control. So uh, as we'll get into uh, when we're calculating the, the significance of, of regions of enrichment, we, we typically, or it is certainly recommended that we use an input to um, to measure the background signal at the uh, at the region um, that we're well genome wide, but certainly at the region that we're calling the peaks in. Um, for a taxi, we don't have that input because what would that be? It would have to be uh, basically shotgun sequencing the whole genome, and so we use the the ataxi library itself um, and uh, essentially randomly dis uh, disperse it around the genome to to calculate the background signal. So that's one major difference. Um, and then the, the other the other difference, as we'll talk about, is that you can use a um, an optional step following um, uh, generating the BAM file um, to uh, take into account the um, transposon or the transpose uh, tr transposons uh, trans <laughs> the the TN five uh, read shifting. 
Um, so this is actually what we're going to go through and, and what Edmund will go through in, in, in the module is um, uh, accounting for uh, essentially a, a, a nine nucleotide uh, shift um, that is introduced by the TN5 uh, introducing of the, um, uh, the, 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 the barcode or, or the tag into the genome. So when the transposon uh, uh, cuts the, the genome, it actually takes out a nine base pair uh, segment uh, to add the, the, essentially the handle that we use for the PCR to lift the library out. Um, and in the ENCODE attack seek workflow, uh, we actually shift the reads over to account for that uh, insertion event or that deletion event. Um, but this is not something that you have to do, um, but it is something that we're going to work through uh, in our module. I think I can see a question. I don't know. I can't see the questions if somebody has one. Okay. Um, so what are some key considerations for ChIP-seq? Well, first of all, antibody specificity and sensitivity. As you know, ChIP-seq involves the use of an antibody to enrich for uh, DNA protein interactions or the, the protein that's bound to the DNA. So antibody specificity and sensitivity is key. You should also be thinking about which marks you want to profile. Depends on the research question, uh, depends on your particular research question. Some, some, I would say, favorites in the community include K27 acetylation that marks active enhancers and tends to be one of the most dynamic uh, features of the epigenome. Also polycomb, K27 trimethylation, this tends to be a mark um, that is often disrupted in, in human diseases, including, uh, including cancer. And then, uh, you know, what are, what are some required sequencing depth? How deep do I need to sequence a library? And, and again, this very much depends on the particular experimental question um, and on the particular target uh, that you're working with. But the, um, you know, the minimum recommendation that's emerged from, from the IHEC consortium, uh, along with ENCODE and, 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 and other groups, is uh, recommends 50 million read pairs for punctate marks. So this would be, uh, for example, H3K4 trimethylation, as I showed you, very punctate at transcriptional start sites. And then for broader marks like H3K9 trimethylation, about double that, so about 100 million read pairs. So that's read pairs. Um, uh, if you're only doing single end sequencing, which used to be a thing, but most people do paired end sequencing, and I would certainly recommend that if you're going to do chip seek, that you use a paired end sequencing workflow. And as we'll talk about, this allows you to accurately measure the ends of the fragment uh, and predict the, the, the fragment occupancy um, which much with much higher specificity than you can um, with single end data. But if you were doing single end data, this would be um, uh, 25 million fragments or 50 million fragments for the broad marks. Okay, many potential biases in chip seek analysis and understanding these uh, are is critical um, for uh, understanding these biases are critical for um, for performing uh, performing uh, chip seek analysis. So really the adage of you know garbage in garbage out. Um, you need to know what the material is going in the sequencer because that material is going to be um, you know <laughs> that's going to influence your uh, uh, your uh, that's going to influence the um, uh, the the output. Okay, and again, I can't see. I can see that people are asking questions, but I uh, I don't know if if you want me to stop or I'll just keep going. All right. So reagent specificity is central to a successful chip seek experiment, um, and I would highly recommend that you. Uh, if you haven't generated the data, that you ask the data generator what, sp what specific QC metrics were run for the antibody, what antibody was used. It is best practice to, uh, in, in any publications, uh, to include both the catalog number and the lot number for the antibody. Um, we spend more effort and more time qualifying the, the antibodies than we do, um, than, well, we spend more cost qualifying the antibodies than we do than the antibodies actually cost. Um, and so, and we typically uh, will qualify a catalog and lot number and then purchase the entire lot if it's a polyclonal antibody so that we have a consistent um, stock that we can use for subsequent IPs. 
So suffice it to say, take some time to qualify your antibody before you start your experiment, before you start your ChIP-seq experiment. And if you're receiving data from, from some other group or you're reanalyzing data, really ask the question of, of you know, what type of qualification was done for that antibody. And we'll talk about some of the ways that we can do that downstream. Um, from the alignments, uh, uh, but also there are uh, molecular te uh, techniques that can be done, done upstream. Um, two that we use is essentially a, a peptide array that shows specificity. You guys probably can't read this, but essentially this top bar uh, shows us that the, 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 that the correct peptide target is the most highly enriched, but you can see that there's also off-target effects for this particular antibody, a polyclonal antibody uh, developed by Diagenode. And then, of course, we do a Western blot, and this is probably one of the worst Western blots I've ever seen, but you can see that, um, that there is a, a specific band um, at uh, uh, only a single band. And we, we look for uh, at least 50% of the signal for a given antibody um, to be in the correct location. Um, uh, in, 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 to qualify an antibody moving forward. And this would really be the first step. And then following this, we would do a pilot chip seek run and compare to existing data sets um, to, to ensure the quality of, of, the, uh, of the antibody. All right, so um, how do we actually do chip seek? Getting into a little bit more details here. So of course we start with our genome. Our genome is made up of nucleosomes that wrap DNA. These nucleosomes uh, contain the N-terminal tails that are modified. In this particular case, um, we'll just pretend this is H3K4 trimethylation. We shear the genome up and we can do this in lots of different ways. We can use transposons um, or, uh, in, in like mint chip, or we can use, uh, we can cross-link with formaldehyde and then use uh, sonication to shear it or you know, the, the technology that we have adopted in, in our group and certainly as part of IHEC is to use native chip seek. So using an MNA sequencing strategy is very well suited for, for, for histone modifications and certainly would be the one that I would recommend um, you do um, if you were uh, uh, doing a chip seek experiment. Once we've digested the genome, we have uh, essentially nucleosomes with uh, DNA associated to them. Um, we then use an antibody uh, to recognize the modification. So then we enrich for fragments of DNA associated to proteins that have the epitope that our antibody recognizes. And this becomes our material um, for a library construction, our IP material. And then we take uh, a little aliquot of, of the genome that we've sheared up and however we've done it, MNAs or, or sonication or so on, and this becomes our input material. So input and IP, those are the two outputs um, from, from a ChIP-seq experiment. So what do we do then? Well, now we have to sequence it. Um, and so how do we do that? Will we add barcodes? Will we, will we add essentially handles on the ends of the fragments of DNA um, that allow us to sequence it? So this is just a, a work, or this is a, a diagram from, from an Illumina system. But of course, this is also true of complete genomics or uh, ion torrent systems or uh, many of the other systems that are uh, coming online uh, over the last 12 to 24 months. But essentially, your DNA insert is what is the material that came through the IP or through your input. We add uh, adapters uh, onto them that allow for sequence so the sequencing um, primer to anneal. So this is read one sequencing primer. This is read two sequencing primer. And at the ends, we add uh, adapters that allow for cluster generation on next generation sequencing platforms. So in the, in the Illumina flavor, these are the so-called P5 and P7. And then importantly, between these two adapters, we have what we call the index or the barcode. And for all ChIP-seq experiments that you'll do, they'll all be indexed. And the index itself is just a, a short, um, typically six, a nucleotide or can be longer um, a sequence of DNA that allows us then to pool many of these libraries together um, and sequence them uh, all in one uh, lane or one you know fragment of a of a of a or you know one flow cell um, uh, and then allow us to split that downstream. Most of you probably won't be involved in in using the index to do the splitting. Um, but it's important to know that it's there, and, and some of you may indeed have to, to leverage it. So uh, we've generated our library, and we have our, uh, barco we have our barcodes, and we have our, um, our adapters on the end of it. 
what do we do next? Well, there are really three methodologies that have been developed for clonal amplification. So now we have to take those fragments and we need to clonally amplify them to allow us to then sequence. Um, and there are three main methods, the, the first being the oil aqueous emulsion, like a, you know, essentially a salad dressing. You're essentially making many, many little small um, uh, reactors in, in, in oil. And this is how 454 and ion torrent do it. Um, this uses a bead uh, to uh, as a as essentially a surface to amplify DNA on, um, uh, and uh, you know, and again, and again uh, is is quite effective. I don't really have time to go through all the details. Uh, the the other way to do it is using a solid surface, um, and this is the technology that really launched um, uh, Celexa and then Illumina. And probably the technology that you'll most likely um, engage be engaged in with chip sequencing, although that's changing. Um, and this uses essentially a solid surface or a microfluidic slide to actually do the cluster gen, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then finally, rolling circle amplification, which was an initially developed by Complete Genomics and has been um, has been um, uh, advanced by MGI or BGI um, for the for the MGI systems where instead of using a solid surface, we, we essentially circularize your chip seek experiment and, and then use a rolling circle amplification to generate clonal copies of the initial fragment. So once we have uh, those, uh, you know, once we have our libraries, how do we actually physically make these clusters that allows us to sequence? Um, and so again, on the Illumina system, um, we have a, a, a slide that looks something like this, although it depends on what system you're, you're using. And there's these uh, addressable lanes. Each lane uh, you know, can generate hundreds of millions of, of read fragments. And so that's why we need to index our libraries before we load them. Um, uh, we load each of these lanes individually in this particular workflow. So you can see the, the flow cell looks here. And we essentially flow our library over the over the surface of the of the slide, um, and the the fragments are captured by DNA molecules that are grafted onto the onto the glass onto the flow cell surface that captures the either the P five or the P seven sequence that we've added to our uh, added to our adapter, uh, or, or that we've added to our insert, and that prov provides us a template to then um, do, uh, uh, to do sequencing. So I'm not going to go through bridge amplification or how we actually generate the clusters, um, but happy to discuss that uh, in the break or, or uh, in Slack if, 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 if you have specific questions. So the sequencing itself is, is fairly straightforward these days. It's essentially sequenced by synthesis. So we, we essentially start with our um, a sequence uh, that is, uh, you know, in this case has a purple uh, uh, oligo. So this would be the P5 oligo, for example, that's hybridized to the flow cell surface. Um, and um, this provides a, 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 a priming, um, um, an, an area where we can prime for DNA synthesis. And then we add the nucleotides. And in the Illumina uh, sequencing chemistry, the, the nucleotides are are protected, so they have a reversible uh, uh, a reversible um, uh, blocker on them that allows us to then add nucleotides one at a time. This is really one of the, the main innovations on the Illumina system. Um, and we add one nucleotide at a time. So here we start with a T that, uh, that hybridizes to an A. Uh, we, we detect that signal um, using a, a laser. That allows the the dye that's connected to the to the T to to illuminate, um, and then we add the next, um, and so on and so on, and we build up uh, the sequence uh, by adding one nucleotide at a time. It's blocked, then deprotected. The next one is added. It's blocked, deprotected, and so on and so on, um, and then we generate a series of images. Um, and starting with the first image, we can uh, generate what we call a focal map, um, where which um, which um, provides a, a structure um, that um, uh, that uh, aligns where the clusters are on the flow cell surface um, with a two-dimensional space, and I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Um, and then from that focal map, we we can then build up the sequence, so T G C T A C one at a time. So um, uh, building the sequence as we go, and that's why it's called sequence by synthesis. 
Um, so it just gives that gen uh, that that uh, um, um, just shows a, an illustration of that. So how does the barcoding itself work? So in paired end sequencing, we sequence in from either end of the read. So read one sequence starts here. This is your insert again. This would be your IP material. So our read one sequencing primer anneals to the red thing here, and we start this um, uh, this read. We then strip that sequence off, and then we do an index sequencing primer. So we actually anneal a primer that anneals to the opposite strand of the read two sequencing primer, and then we read into the in index. And then we strip the entire thing off, and we actually regenerate the cluster. Um, so we we do bridge amplification bridge amplification again, and then we read into read two sequencing primer, uh, reading into the opposite orientation. So so we're, we're generating multiple individual reads or multiple individual uh, workflows that, that generate multiple FASTQ files, as I'll talk about. So how does the base calling itself work? We start with these intensity files that are the images that we're generating from, uh, from the sequencing as we go through the sequence by synthesis process. This generates uh, what's called a BCL file. This is a binary base call file. So this will be the file that, um, uh, that is used to then convert into the file type that we'll be working with today called the FASTQ file. And I introduced the BCL file here because for some of you who might be working um, in the future or maybe even now with single cell data, so for example, using a 10x uh, you know, single cell attack seek data, for example, um, you would actually interact with the BCL file and you'd have to use a um, a, a wrapper or a, uh, a, a, a what, what is known as the, the BCL to FASTQ conversion um, that would then <clears throat> generate your index split um, from the BCL file itself. We won't be going into that today, but just to remember that the BCL is the file before the FASTQ file. And if you're using a single cell um, uh, technologies that you'll need to use the BCL file uh, uh, as the input to generate your FASTQ files. So, um, you know, as we generate sequence data, um, uh, you know, we, we need to have some way of assessing the quality of the base calls that are generated off this off the platforms. So this is uh, this is obviously a, a very tricky thing to do since we have no way of knowing what the gold standard is. And so something called the Fred score was developed actually as part of the human genome project. And it was actually developed on the, the forerunner of second generation sequencing uh, called Sanger sequencing. So first generation sequencing. And it, it essentially is this, um, uh, is it essentially a, a way of, of providing a probability um, that a base, um, it, that the base itself is called incorrectly. And so the formula is here, base quality is the negative 10 log transformation of, of the probability um, that a base is incorrect. And you don't need to understand the details beyond knowing that this is empirically determined. So the way that this has been termined, determined for the Illumina system and, and other um, platforms is essentially resequencing a known sequence, so a, a synthesized sequence, over and over and over again, and then um, generating essentially a, a series of observations uh, that allow us to then assign a probability uh, for that base. And I've given you the example here. It's a little, a little bit harder to conceptualize uh, on the Illumina platform, but for this for the Sanger platform, for example, it, it, it's how the peaks were were spaced as they came off the back end, et cetera. So same principle. We use the same um, quality metric for for Illumina sequencing um, or for next generation sequencing, which is the Fred uh, based quality score. So how how do we actually um, how do we go from these images to to sequence data and what why do I keep harping about um, the the where the clusters are generated on the flow cell surface and the reason for this is because you can imagine if you're generating a, an experiment where you have millions or hundreds of millions of individual sequence fragments we need to have a way of uniquely naming each of those sequence fragments. And so that's actually done by um, looking at the position of the cluster um, in, in two-dimensional space. So I talked about that focal map that's generated before we start doing the sequencing or during the sequencing process. 
And that focal map is actually composed of a uh, essentially what we call a tile. So we break a little piece of, of the lane into a chunk, um, into a, a two-dimensional piece where we have a y-coordinate and an x-coordinate. Um, and is obviously very highly dense. And each of these little clusters that you see here is then assigned an X and Y coordinate. And so that allows us then to uniquely name the read um, as the flow cell ID, the lane it is on. In this particular case, this is eight lanes. Um, they can come in many different flavors. Um, and then the X and Y coordinate uh, for that particular read. And that... Um, is then used as the unique name for that particular sequence that is then carried through um, the rest of the analysis. And that unique name is absolutely required uh, to allow us to, to work with, for example, indexed reads or, uh, or paired end reads because it's the, it's the one handle that allows us to relate the sequences uh, to one another. So how do we report out the sequence reads that come off? the Illumina systems or, or any next generation sequencing system, well, we use something called a FASTQ file. And this is really an evolution of the FASTA file that many of you may be aware of. So the FASTA file is how we, we uh, store, for example, reference genome sequencing, the sequences that you, you'll be using. The FASTQ file is slightly different in that it contains your, um, your sequence, but it also contains uh, the FRED quality score. Um, so that quality score, that log negative log 10 transformation of the probability um, uh, in, in the read. So a FASTQ is the universal standard for uh, encoding uh, ne next generation sequencing data. Um, it starts with an at character followed by a unique uh, sequence name, as we'll talk about. It contains your nucleotide sequence string. There's an optional uh, third line um, that is sometimes replicates the, the information in the first line, but most often is blank. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, we encode the, the, the base qualities. And the base qualities are, as I said, fraud, FRED scores, but you're looking at that and you're saying that doesn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of glyphs. Um, and those glyphs are actually ASCII encoding. So it so we essentially use ASCII encoding in the FASTQ file as a way of simply compressing um, uh, a two digits into a single digit. So uh, the only thing you need to know to convert um, from the FASTQ file um, glyphs into a FRED score is what the base is, and the universal standard for FASTQ is base 33. Um, and so knowing base 33, you would you would look up whatever the symbol is. Let's say for example a nine. Um, uh, you, nine equals 57. So if you, if you look in the table, you'll see nine is equal to 57. You minus by the base, um, in this case, base 33 to get you a FRED quality score of 24 at equals 64. Um, so you can look for the glyph of at, I can't see it here. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Um, here it is. Um, so at equals 64, um, minus 33 gives us a quality score of 31. So luckily, um, and you know, you will not likely have to do these conversions, but I did want to did want to introduce this to you because you'll see these in your FASTQ file. And if you're ever wondering what they are, these are the base qualities um, for, for each of the bases as they come off. Okay, so note that, um, as I said, like during the sequencing process, the read one and read two are generated using, are generated independently and they um, result in independent FASTQ files. This is also true for your index, as I said. And, you know, in, in uh, I guess, you know, more recently, we've, we've even moved to a dual barcode system where we have indexes on either end. So um, some of you might be familiar with, with, with two barcodes, essentially the same process, except we're reading the index off both the five prime and the three prime end of the fragment. And that index, and read one and read two are all associated to each other using the unique sequence name that's generated from the X and Y coordinate of that of that um, uh, of, of the original tile. So so that's how we uh, are able to relate read one, read two, and read three together. Um, so what does that look like? So here's an example of a uh, a, a sequence name that comes off uh, an Illumina system where we can see um, the, the lane here. So this is just the flow cell number, um, the lane um, uh, here, 
uh, the tile 1101 um, and the X and the Y coordinate, and then some optional information sometimes containing what read it is. But so here is um, uh, tile X and Y coordinate. And so this is actually what it looks like in a FASTQ file. So again, we can see this information, um, and the and these are two independent FASTQ files, um, and you can look at these yourself uh, on on the AWS uh, uh, data repo, um, and you can look for the for the sequence names, which will look slightly different than this, um, but but the principle is exactly the same. And the way that we relate these to each other is again through the sequence name, and it's critically important that before you start your alignment, before we move these into BWA. Um, that the reads are um, uh, read names sorted so that the, the, the names are or that the reads are sorted by um, their, their read name. So the first read in the, the read one FASTQ file that you use and the first read in the read two FASTQ file you use has the same name. It's just uh, different in terms of whether it was read one and read two and so on and so on. And so that order has to be retained. Uh, otherwise, BDOA will, will, will choke. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, the, the, as, as we'll go through, we'll use different types of sorting of reads. So this is read name sorted, but the other common way of sorting reads once they're aligned is coordinate sorted. So we actually sort them um, with respect to their coordinates on a genome or on a reference. Um, so that's called coordinate sorting. But before they enter BWA, they must be read name sorted. And this is the default that comes out of um, out of an Illumina system, but some of you might, for example, um, uh, be given a BAM file, so given a, an alignment file, um, and have to convert it back to a FASTQ file. And if you have to do this, remember that you need to read name, uh, sort your uh, sort the outputs before you then go into uh, a realignment step. Okay, so we've completed our chip se uh, sequencing run. I've given you some um, sort of high-level details about um, how the, the sequencing run is done. How do we assess the quality of the resulting sequence file? Um, and so there's really kind of three main areas to focus on. First is the sequence quality, uh, and Edmund will go through um, using a tool called FASTQC um, that, that, uh, that allows us to assess sequence quality. Um, the second is library quality. So how, how well did the, the library sequence? So what are some metrics that we can use to assess that? And then finally, the IP quality. And I'll talk about metrics that we use there as well. So sequencing quality can be, can be measured in a number of different ways. A very handy tool is FASTQC. Um, uh, it's a very easy tool to run. Um, and this will provide a series of metrics for your experiment. Um, uh, against a, a series of benchmarks um, that you can look at um, and give you a, an assessment of how well the sequencing run worked. You should also get this information from your sequence provider. So whoever you did your, your chip sequ uh, sequencing library for, um, uh, they'll, they'll be able to provide you uh, the overall mean quality scores, et cetera. So you should pay attention to those. And of course, those quality scores are encoded in uh, a FRED quality, uh, FRED quality system. Or, or framework. So what about library quality? How do we assess the overall library quality? Well, the main way we do this is to look at the diversity of the IP fragment. So when I mean diversity, I mean how, may, how well does the library represent um, the genome? Um, and the way that we do this is, is we look at what's known as the PCR duplicate rate. So the number of PCR duplicates um, that are uh, that are present in the library. Of course, PCR is used uh, during the ChIP-seq workflow uh, to amplify the fragments once we either have added our transposon or, um, or after we've added our adapters, um, we use PCR to generate uh, sufficient fragments to move on to the sequencing um, uh, step. So, um, and we'll, we'll talk about how you calculate PCR duplicates once we uh, go through the alignment module. Um, but just to say that, um, you know, uh, th there is a wide range of, of, of PCR duplicate, or, or you will find a, a, a large range of PCR duplicates, anywhere from a few percentages. And this is, 
essentially showing just a, a random set of libraries that were generated um, uh, in, in my lab from, you know, starting from the left side to the right side and increasing in PCR duplicates. So you'll see that there's there's a range of, of uh, duplicates that you see and the way we look at it is we say, well, um, you know, here, here are some, you know, here are the three new libraries we, we've sequenced. How do they compare in terms of their duplicate rate um, to the distribution of this of this other set? Um, and are there, you know, if they're on the, the on the high end, you know, that might be something that we that we want to take a look at. So, for example, this library here would be one that we would consider to be, uh, you know, likely either a poor quality or failed because it has a very high du duplicate rate. So there are two types of uh, PCR duplicates that are that are that are generated. Um, so uh, the 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 first type is a PCR duplicate that is generated um, from uh, during the library construction. Remember that this PCR duplicate is not a result of clonal amplification that happens on the flow cell surface. This is uh, a, you know the cluster generation process itself. Um, uh, it is essentially clonally amplifying that first PCR fragment. It's the step before that, um, when we're making the library after the IP, where PCR duplicates are uh, introduced. And we define these after alignment as reads that have identical start and stop positions with respect to the reference. So this is how we define them. And again, we'll, we'll get into the details of that as we get into the, into the hands-on component. But suffice it to say, PCR duplicates defined by identical starts and stop relative to a sequence. So, so why, why do we care about these duplicates? Well, you know, the, the, clearly these duplicates, um, uh, you know, can introduce experimental artifacts, um, but of course they could also be um, uh, a consequence of, of, of real chip seek signal. So for example, if we had a region of the genome that was highly occupied for whatever our target is, let's say H2K4 trimethylation, we might get actually, you know, real what we call biological duplicates. So they're actually individual fragments of, of the genome that we've sampled more than once. So they, they are actually pulled down in the IP more than once um, and are really truly biological duplicates. Um, and these can occur and they do occur in regions where we have high occupancy. Now, you know, the, these are the good kind of duplicates and they're actually met, you know, we, in, in order to be quantitative in the measurement of, of that particular feature, um, we would need to know what those, you know, we would need to take those into account. However, for most chip sequencing experiments, we don't have a way of determining um, whether the duplicate that we're seeing is a good duplicate, or in other words, a biological duplicate, or a bad duplicate, in other words, a duplicate that's arose through PCR, um, PCR amplification. There are methodologies that you can use to tag the fragments um, as you're doing your IP. So you can actually add a molecular barcode onto the end of the fragment. Um, this this uh, can be done, um, and uh, but it does introduce some additional challenges in the in the um, uh, in the alignment process. Um, again, happy to talk about, um, but it allows you to do uh, what what's called UMI marking, so unique unique molecular index. So just think about it in the way that if you had if you uh, attached a unique barcode after you did your IP before you added your adapters. That would give you a, a unique barcode for that individual fragment that you're that you've generated, and then you could use that UMI as a handle to to disentangle um, PCR duplicates from from biological duplicates. And again, if you're working in single cell space, you'll know that UMIs are attached to, for example, attack seq fragments uh, using on the 10x platform and single cell RNA seq. So you actually use the UMIs as a way of uh, determining uh, true uh, biological uh, duplicates from, uh, from, uh, from PCR duplicates. But for, the, for most chip seq workflows, this is not done um, as it introduces a number of experimental challenges in, in actually building the libraries and also uh, in, in computational challenges, which I'm happy to discuss. So anyway, the, the take home, uh, I always like to give you a take home. Fault um, PCR duplicates are removed um, uh, in for downstream workflows. 
So, um, you know, this is, you know, probably the, the, the work, the workflow that you'll do and certainly the one that we'll, we'll follow, uh, in, in the module. So, but it really depends and I, and I, you know, is something that you need to think about, um, as you, as you work on your data. Okay. So that's library diversity. Really, we're looking at, um, PCR duplicates as a, as a, as a surrogate for library diversity. Um, what is the other uh, um, quality metric that we can use? And, and that is an IP quality. So how do we know that the IP itself enriched for features that, that um, or enriched for features in the genome? So there are two common ways we do this. One is called a FRIP score. So FRIP is um, the fraction of sequence alignments that, that actually are uh, called within peaks. So we're going to use MAX2 to call enriched regions in the genome as we'll get into. And then once we have those enriched regions, we can simply ask the question, well, how many of the sequence of the original sequence reads actually aligned into those, into those enriched regions? Obviously, the higher the number or the higher the fraction of reads that aligned into, the, um, into these uh, enriched regions or peaks, um, the better quality of the data or the more signal to background you have for that particular library. Um, another way to do it, uh, another common metric that's generated is, is domain reads. So this requires a little bit of foreknowledge in terms of what the expected um, signal um, um, uh, signature will be for the, for the IP or the expected occupancy for the particular mark that you're looking at. So for example, if you're looking at K27 acetylation, you can, you can uh, take a, a, a set of enhancer regions that have been defined by, let's say, the ENCODE consortium, and then you can ask yourself, well, or you can compute how many of your uh, enriched regions overlap with, with known enhancers. And obviously, the higher the, the amount of overlap, um, the better the quality of that, or the, the, more, um, the better the quality of that particular IP. So again, like all of these quality metrics, um, these scores are widely distributed. And I'm just giving you this example so that you, you can get a, a, a feel for, for how widely distributed they are. Um, th these are data sets that are generated as part of the IHEC consortium. Um, and these are FRIP scores for a particular mark, uh, K27 acetylation. And you can see that they range anywhere from you know, on the low, uh, you know, maybe 10% or even below, all the way up to, to over, you know, over 75%. So, um, and, you know, again, there are many reasons, experimental reasons. Some of these cell types are very rare, um, are, 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 are much harder to work with. Other cell types, and I would imagine that most of these on, on the right-hand side are probably from cell lines, which are much more easy to work with and, and generally give much higher IP signal to noise. But, but all of these data sets um, uh, are, you know, potentially, uh, uh, or all of these data sets um, will generate signal uh, that we'll be able to determine using MAX2, um, but you will have to take into account, for example, if you're comparing data from a very high FRIP score to a very low FRIP score, uh, you'll need to, to, uh, to take into account the, the differences in, in the false negative and false positive rates of those samples. Okay, so those are the ChIP-seq um, uh, quality scores, and those are the ones that we'll be computing as part of the module, so we can get into a little bit more details as we get there. Um, and finally, you know, just attack-seq measurements, well, what are the kinds of things that we can use to, to look at the, at the quality of an attack-seq um, data set? Well, you know, there are kind of two main uh, areas. One is to look at the, the fragment profile. So if we align the reads to the genome, and we look at the distance of the, or the length of those fragments um, that were generated, we should expect to see a, a, a representation of, of, or at least a pattern that, that mirrors um, nucleosome content. So single nucleosome, di, di nucleosome, trisome, nucleosome, et cetera. And of course, the, the frequencies are gonna drop as we get to the larger fragment sizes, because these are limited by the sequencing platform, and as we get into the to the lower um, uh, into the into the single nucleosome regime, you know, around 150, 160 nucleotides, um, we can actually start to see uh, this uh, DNA pitch. So you'll you'll start to see this stutter in the the fragment length distribution that you can compute from the alignments. And this stutter is an indication of of of, of a high quality attack seek library. We can also then, uh, you know, use a similar strategy. So as domain reads, 
and we can look where in the genome um, our alignments uh, or where in the genome our alignments are enriched. And of course, we expect that uh, ataxic reads will be aligned in regions um, such as promoters, enhancers, et cetera. And so the, 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 the uh, enrichment of the signal within known feature sets of ataxic is also a way uh, of assessing the quality. Okay, finally, I just wanted to talk about one last thing, uh, in, in, and this applies to both ataxic and, chip, and chipseq, and that is the so-called blacklisted regions. Uh, a really a, a project that Anshul Kandaji um, at Stanford um, uh, really started on uh, in, in the ENCODE consortium. And, and this is actually a, a, a filter that we'll be using as part of the workflow. So what the heck is this? Well, it turns out that, you know, in, in the reference genome, and certainly this is true in the human genome and also true in, in most mammalian genome, um, the assemblies are, are not complete, as I think we know, certainly for HG38. Um, and there are regions of the genome that are represented only once in the assembly that you're using, but actually in the genome that you've sequenced, they're represented multiple times. And so what's the consequence of that? So this is a repetitive region in the genome um, that's, say, present a thousand times in the genome that you're sequencing, but only present once or twice or, or even less in, in the reference genome. Um, and, and what these look like is you get these very large what we call read stacks that occur uh, in regions of the genome that are not um, related to signal intensity, but rather are related to an, an alignment artifact due to the fact that that sequence is, uh, you know, uh, misassembled or, or, or represented only a single time, as I mentioned, um, in the genome. And we need to remove these because these are actually quite prominent. Um, they, they can uh, cover up to, you know, a few percentage of the genome. And of course, when we're looking at a differential uh, analysis, uh, we may be working in that same regime of just a few percentages. Um, this just shows you four, four genome, uh, genomes here. So, um, you know, can be quite prominent in the mouse here. It's, you know, almost 7% of the mouse. If we do uh, a, a correlation between um, uh, a set of data sets um, and look at uh, the correlation, when, when we don't filter the peaks, we can see that a lot of the correlation is not driven by biology but rather is driven by um, uh, enrichment in these blacklisted regions. Um, and so we can, once we remove that, then we start to see uh, bi uh, you know, biological signal much, uh, you know, uh, which, which with much higher correlation values. Where are these in the genome? These, as I said, tend to be in regions of misassembly or regions where there's gaps or, or satellite repeats, et cetera, et cetera. And so best practice is to remove, uh, is to, to filter against um, the blacklist, blacklisted regions to remove these prior to your analysis. And again, we'll be doing that as part of the, as part of the workflow.